Thanks, Mike, uh, for that introduction. And thank you as well, the organizers of the Parker uh, Arts Lecture Series for giving me this opportunity to talk to you today about things that I find very pas I'm passionate about. And so I'll tell you a story today about ultraviolet light, stem cells, uh, the stem cells that live in skin, and as well as the normal functions of stem cells in this process called homeostasis. And this is actually very important because it, I think it underlies a lot of the, the diseases sometimes that we encounter. And homeostasis, I think, is, is you can think of it as, imagine setting your thermostat to 72 degrees. So you have a furnace that basically heats up the house when it gets a little cooler, below 72. And then you have the AC that brings it down. So skin kind of does the same thing. Really, all, of, all your organs do that to maintain certain levels of the body. Then I'll tell you a little bit about cancer, in particular cancer or skin, uh, cancer in skin, and then talk about how to prevent skin cancer. And then the current treatments challenges how we study skin cancer, and then perspective on the future and links to useful information at the end. I would like to say that also that my opinions today are really as, for, as a scientist and do not necessarily represent the opinions or views of the University of Colorado, nor is it really meant as medical advice or treatment of cancer. So if you, if you have you know, relevant questions that, re, that really should be answered by a medical professional, I suggest you that you go and talk to your, your doctor. They could better give you recommendations for any kind of diagnosis or treatment. So I think we're living in Colorado, we're all aware about the sunlight and the exposure to ultraviolet radiation. And if you look at this diagram showing you the UV index across the entire country for the month of July, but this really could be August or any of the summer months really, you see down here that the UV index is very high. And this sliver down here is where we are in Colorado in the mountains. Well, Denver will be outside, but basically, showing you that the highest level of ultraviolet exposure, ultraviolet light exposure happen in high elevations. And if you can see this diagram here, it kind of illustrates that, where if you begin from sea level and you keep going up in elevation, every 1,000 feet, you get an extra 5% extra exposure of sunlight. So even in, in Parker or Denver, you're still getting quite a bit of ultraviolet radiation. And for me, it was very, um, basically surprising and shocking when I came here and I went outside for the first time, you can feel the sun burning you. So of those of you who like to go up to the mountains, up 14,000 feet if you get to the summit, you're really getting almost double the amount of, of UV exposure that you would if you were sitting at sea level. This is particular for anybody, whether this, during the summer months or even when you go skiing. So the first thing that happens when ultraviolet light hits your body, it, it confronts the skin. And so I'm sure that you're all familiar <laughs> with maybe some of the functions of skin. So right now, if you just, just take, a, take a look at your hand, okay? If you look at the palm, it has no hair, it's kind of thick. If you turn it over and you look the other side, it's actually very thin skin and you can feel the hairs. So there's a lot of variation between different parts of your body and the type of skin. Some is thicker, some is thinner, some is more, has more cushion. But in the end of the day, it's kind of divided on, on three different parts. The first part, the superficial part, is the epidermis, shown here. The second part is the dermis. And the last is the hypodermis, really where the fat tissue is. And that gives you kind of the shape to your body. The interesting thing about the epidermis, though, is that you, you see there's no blood vessels at all the blood vessels are actually found de-embedded in the dermis. So a lot of the nutrients are basically given from the dermis to the epidermis. You'll notice these long uh, hair follicles sticking out. They traverse the epidermis all the way embedded into the dermis. And there's this muscle. So when you, when you get a fright or uh, basically they stand, your hair stand on end, those are the muscles responsible for that. So as I alluded to, skin is really the first barrier that, that, that protects you from the outside world. And we talk about barrier function because it's so important for, for the functioning of your skin and also your body as well. So it prevents pathogens from entering. 
It also, any kind of insult that may come to your skin, for example, if you dump paint on your skin, right? It doesn't penetrate the upper layers. Or even if you superficially burn yourself, you're just burning the outside layer. It also plays a very important role in retaining moisture. And people who suffer from severe burns, almost 30% of, of, their, of their body, they, they are in serious uh, jeopardy of dying because of the loss of blood and moisture. So there's, there's that element, as well as it provides physical protection. If you try to rub your skin, it doesn't come off. So it actually helps to basically keep you together. And as well, when it's hot, you sweat. So it, it provides also some regulation for temperature. The other thing is that it actually plays a very important role in immune surveillance. And that means that there are cells that sit between the dermis and the epidermis that are basically waiting in case any kind of thing gets through the barrier. And then to then signal by releasing cytokines, which are really immune signals to professional immune cells to come in and mop up the, the infection if it happens to be an infection. Lastly, it actually also does produce a lot of vitamin D. And this is actually very important. In North America, it is thought that there's a lot of people who actually have deficiency of vitamin D levels in their blood. And that can have serious consequences for disease because of the fact that vitamin D plays such an important role in how our body functions. So on one hand, ultraviolet radiation can be very bad. It can burn you. It could make you look older. It can cause cancer, as I'll talk about. But in the same token, you need some of it because you need to produce vitamin D. And the other thing about skin is that it's actually one of the largest organs in your body. If you were to take your skin and lay it out, it's about 20 square feet per person. It's actually one of the largest organs and it, it uses up about one third of your blood supply. And this is in over a course of, of about a month and a bit, your whole surface of the skin is turned over. So imagine that the entire surface gets turned over on a regular basis. And that's actually very true for probably most organs. And the things that actually do this, that maintain and replenish and repair skin are these very specialized cells called stem cells. So what are stem cells? So I'm sure you may have heard in the news, you've heard about embryonic stem cells. You maybe heard about these induced pluripotent stem cells. But what exactly are these cells? So really they have kind of three properties. One, they make actually more of themselves, self-renewal. And then they become something else. So these are progenitors. They tend to be proliferate not as, as much as the stem cells. And they usually become very specialized cells and organs. So it, this is kind of known as differentiation. So they go from an immature cell to something that's more mature, but has very specific functions. And the other thing about stem cells is that they live in certain places in tissue. They're not everywhere. There are very specific places that provide the signals that are necessary for it to self-renew, and then the signals for them to become something else. And really, there are two types of stem cells, the ones that are found in, in developing embryos and the ones that are found in adult tissue. And when you have a sperm and an egg that come together and make a fertilized zygote that eventually becomes in, gets embedded and becomes a human fetus, this essentially is a stem cell because it has the ability to become all the cells that are necessary to form the fetus from these inner cell mass cells, which then give rise to all the different types of organs in your body, whether it be the heart, the skin, the brain, the intestine, everything. But they're more restricted. So these ones can become everything. These can only become those three layers and eventually all the organs of your tissue. And these can only really function in these tissues. And that's what these uh, names really, meant, really mean. So every organ in your body, you will find reservoirs of stem cells that have the capacity to make more of themselves and become specialized cells in that organ. So for example, over here, you can see that in blood, in the bone marrow, this is where hematopoietic stem cells live, these guys become the white blood cells that are part of the, the adapted immune system, T cells and B cells, as well as the myeloid lineage down here, which includes the innate immunity that responds to infections, 
and as well as blood. So we know that blood replenishes about every up to 120 days is how the life, life of a red blood cell, unlike what happens in some of these cells that may only live a few weeks. So there's perpetual renewal and differentiation of blood on a continual basis, and that's the job of the stem cells. And likewise in skin, if we look a little bit closer, we also find these stem cells that are doing exactly the same role, but in skin. So this is what a pathologist would look at if they were to do a biopsy of your skin and then stain it to be able to look at the structure of the cells. The, the blue is actually the nucleus where the DNA lives. And as you move further up, you begin to go from less differentiated to more differentiated cells. And this can be kind of represented here in this diagram, it gives you a little bit more details. But essentially the interfollicular between the hair follicles, the stem cells are here. And they then divide and move up to become this terminally differentiated cell that expresses very different proteins than the cells down here. They actually lose their nucleus and really a carcass of a cell up here that gets cross-linked to make this very strong barrier at the top. So you know this, and, and, and all of you have seen this, when if you, if you take a sour and then rub your skin, what you come off are those dead cells. And this is actually a continual process. And this is very important because there are actually certain diseases where, where babies are born where they cannot lose those dead cells. And the dead cells pile up to the point that the skin breaks. And these children live, if they live at all, live miserable lives. So this is actually a normal process that maintains the structure integrity of skin and its normal functions. And as I told you, stem cells kind of live in, in homes and places in the tissue. And I already told you about the spaces in between the, your hair follicles, but there's also a reservoir of hair or stem cells that live right beside this muscle that when you get frightened and pulls up your hairs, it's called the bulge region, and it's actually a home for stem cells. So these guys are really responsible for renewal of most of your skin. And if you injure your skin, then you activate these guys, and then they travel upwards to then help restore the function. So in other words, they're trying to restore, restore homeostasis, kind of like that thermostat we talked about at the beginning. All right, this is another way of looking at it. So here what I, we're doing is we're looking at the, the, the skin of a mouse that has been, uh, basically we tagged some of these stem cells with a green fluorescent protein. So this is the inner area that we talked about, this basal layer that has stem cells. And so as they go up, going towards the terminally differentiated area, you can see the change in morphology. So if we actually do this in 3D, you can see that these green cells eventually came up to the top. And the red is basically contribution from other cells outside that are not labeled here. So you can see they kind of interdigitate. And this is very important. It's kind of like a brick and mortar structure that provides the, the strong function of skin and provides a barrier against the outside world. So what I've told you is that it is a continual process. It's very regimented. And so it is very, the architecture of skin is very organized to be able to do its normal function. And proliferation, I'm sure you all are familiar about how cells divide. One cell becomes two cell. And this is kind of visualized here, where one cell here, we actually tag the nucleus with a red fluorescent protein. So then we can actually track the DNA. And you can see that everything kind of condenses in the middle. And then now you have two cells. This is the normal process of cell division. In normal tissue, this is very regimented, and, and it produces two cells that are mostly identical to each other. The same amount of genetic information that was here in the mother cell is passed down to each of these daughter cells down here. So what I'm gonna show you right now, this is, this is actually, if you look at your hand, and if you imagine you could magnify in, right into your skin, what you would see is, we tag these researchers tagged the nucleus with green fluorescent pro protein so you can visualize them. And you can see there's our hair follicle, so it's coming at you. And then here are four different fields of cells. And if we run this, this is what actually cell division looks like, where the DNA has been replicated and then pulled apart to give you two different cells. We're, not, we're only visualizing the nucleus to look for the cells. The point that I'm trying to make here is 
is that although we have many cells in this field, there's only four of them that are actually divided at any one time. And that's very important because of the fact that, again, to be able to maintain the normal functions of skin, you need the stem cells have to obey certain signals, when to divide, how to divide, when to differentiate. So when you lose cells, there is a signal that it says, okay, we, we lost a cell and we need to, to get to the factory to produce more to maintain that certain level so we can maintain function. So I just wanted to give you, kind of put this all in perspective. If you, if you take a ruler, here's basically an inch, and this is centimeters. In science, we, we actually focus on the metric system. So here's a centimeter, and if you divide that to, if you look at a millimeter, so this is a millimeter square. So in that millimeter square, there's about 93,000, if you look at skin, there's 93,000 cells. In comparison, there's only, you would only find about 2,000 melanocytes. The average time to be able to turn over a human epidermis is about 40 to 75 days. However, in a disease called psoriasis, which may have, you may be familiar with, you may know somebody who has it, it's a very common disease, there's a massive expansion of the epidermis. And the turnover is much more rapid. This is not normal. So this leads to, as I'll show here, there's a rapid expansion that happens because the stem cells are being mobilized to, to replicate. However, the normal function of the skin has been disrupted. So these people who have psoriasis actually have a, an impaired barrier function and there's a strong immune reaction to it, people think. And if you look down here, if you look at normal skin, non-legional skin, you only see very few cells that are actually dividing, unlike what you would see in a lesional area of, of a psoriatic plaque. So these would be dividing cells. So then we come to the question of how, how are the stem cells related to skin cancer? As I told you, the ultimate fate of any stem cell in skin stem cell is to be lost. However, the stem cells are there for your entire life. So they're the ones responsible for replenishing the skin on a regular basis. So what exactly is cancer? Let's, let's take a step back and just talk about cancer for a bit. And I know all of you have probably experienced somebody in your life who has cancer, or maybe you have cancer in your life and survived, or you know somebody who has. I had an uncle who died of, of colon cancer, another one who survived. So the, the easiest way to explain cancer, I think, is that it's a disease of proliferation. So if you think about a car, to be able to drive, you have to start your car, put your foot on the brake, and then to drive on, you release the brake, you put on the gas. When you come to a stop sign or a red light, you stop, you see a green light, you go. Uh, if you see yellow, you probably still go, at least in Colorado. Um, so what the brake represents, there are mechanisms in cells that are called tumor, uh, there are genes and mechanisms that prevent tumors. There are basically tumor suppression mechanisms and genes. And they're kind of like the brakes. And there are oncogenes that kind of drive that proliferation. And they're kind of like the gas. So a tumor really has a defective brake and the gas is always on. And really when you see a green light, you still go. And when you see a red light, you still go. So in, in skin, um, so let's go a step a step back and, and let's talk about a little bit about skin cancer. So you may not be aware of this, but there's about greater than 2 million new cases of skin cancer per year in the U S It is actually equivalent to all other cancers combined. The thing about, um, sk uh, skin cancer is that because there's so many of them, dermatologists are actually not mandated to keep registers of how many cases they see. And then one of the reasons is because one of the most common types of skin cancer is called basal cell carcinoma. And this type usually is not metastatic, which means that it doesn't leave the primary site. There sometimes can be very disfiguring and very troublesome. And people will have to get surgeries to reconstruct the area where the, where the cancer grew. But generally, the mortality rate associated with these type of cancers is not very high. Unlike squamous cell carcinoma that 
constitute about 30% of cells, and then melanoma only constitutes about 3.6. You Now you hear a lot about melanoma because it tends to be a more aggressive cancer. So just to put this in perspective, there's about 15,000 years because of advanced squamous cell carcinomas, but there's also a huge cost to treating non-melanoma cancers. This is back in 2004. It cost you about $1.4 billion to treat, and in today's dollar, it's a lot higher. And it generally affects people as they age. So if you're over 50, you have a greater risk of getting a non-melanoma non -melanoma skin cancer, especially if you tend to be a lighter skin person and you are very active and go outside. And that'll go back to this, when we get, go back to the question about talking about stem cells, why that is. But something that maybe a lot of people don't know is that if you actually have a non-melanoma skin cancer, it actually predisposes you to getting other types of cancer. So that's a, that's, a major, that's a major problem. And people who are immunocompromised, if you had an organ transplant, you are actually high, very high risk of getting a recurrent of metastatic SEC. And in fact, some of these patients, they will develop 20 or 30 tumors in their body. And, and this becomes very challenging in the clinic to be able to treat these patients, especially given the fact that they're immunocompromised. So because your stem cells are with you with your entire life, they're really the only ones that can unfortunately accumulate a lot of damage because of exposure to violet radiation. Or it also could be done due to chemicals. It's not just UV, it's really environmental insults. The very first skin cancers that were, the, that were noticed in the first models were because people who worked with tar were developing skin tumors. So chemical carcinogenesis and ultraviolet radiation carcinogenesis is very common, it can be common. So unfortunately, because of the fact that these guys are with you, they're the ones that can accumulate alterations and mutations that eventually allows them to be able to form under certain conditions. This is not a given, as I'll explain to you later, but when they form, we think that the same stem cells that are orderly dividing and differentiating to keep the normal functions of skin these are the ones that are now kind of functioning in cancer to maintain the cancer. For example, in basal cell carcinoma, there is, it is driven through a very specific pathway. And the company developed a drug that could basically block the pathway. Patients on these drugs, they saw their tumors reverse completely, except when they removed the drug, the tumor came back. And that's because they hadn't killed these potential replenishing cells that we're going to call cancer stem cells that basically repopulated the tumor. Now, I know all of you are aware when, when you've gone to the sun and spent back in your yard gardening, hiking, skiing, and if you're lucky enough, you get a little bit darker, but you don't blister or you don't peel. But really, what you may not be aware of is that actually any tanning is actually a damage to your skin. And when you get darker, I generally to get darker, it is basically a response to the damage. And this is a way of protecting you from further damage. Unfortunately, if you don't produce a lot of melon, if you're lighter skin, if you spend too much time and you don't use sunblock, what happens is that you have severe damage to your skin, such as these blisters and the, the peeling of the skin. What happens is that the ultraviolet radiation will damage the DNA inside of the, of the keratinocytes, which are the cells in the epidermis. And there, we remember you talked about this tumor suppressor. This is basically gets activated to prevent this cell from dividing until it has an opportunity to be able to then repair the damage. But at the same time, it releases molecules that signal to melanocytes to release more pigment that the keratinocytes then pick up and you become darker. And people who are fairer skinned, they're still, they have melanocytes and they are producing some pigment, but they don't have as much as someone who's a little bit darker. And if you damage very severely, such that you cannot repair the damage, it induces cell death, which means the cells die because they're just too damaged. And this would lead to the blistering and also the peeling. So really your best way to prevent skin cancer is to prevent it by using a sunblock when you go outside, 
And really all you need is 30 SPF, sun protection factor. This will give you about 95% protection. If, if you were to go up to you know, 100 SPF or 50, it's only incremental. You really need only 50. And it doesn't really matter what type, either the mineral-based or, or some of the other chemical-based. They all kind of do the same thing. They all basically reduce the damage that the sun can do on your, on your, on your skin. The other thing is that it's not a bad idea also to wear a hat with a wide brim to protect your face, sunglasses to protect your eyes, and basically UV resistant clothing that covers your arms and your legs. But again, this is a balance, right? So I told you that you need, you need sunlight for vitamin D, but you also need to protect yourself from too much radiation, too much of a good thing. Okay, so let's talk about how, if you are unfortunate enough to have a skin cancer, how is exactly are they treated? Luckily, if you catch it early and you go to the clinic to see a, a, a dermatologist, really the most successful thing you can do or the most successful treatment is excision and most surgery. Um, and this is basically just a, uh, where they, well, I'll explain later, but it basically allows you to remove the tumor. And most of the time, if you do this, your cure rate is, is probably very high towards anywhere between 95 to almost 99% of those tumors that come in, especially basal cell carcinomas, that you can actually remove them and you're probably gonna be okay. Now, there are some other treatments such as 5-fluorouracil, imucamod, and isonol metubate. And these are really treating kind of those early lesions and there's, we can talk about those later, but suffice to say that these are more targeted to the early or less benign, or less more benign tumors. And how does, going back to the surgery, what happens is that the dermatologist will basically take slivers of your tumor and then look at the margins. A pathologist will examine the margins to make sure that there's no tumor. And if they find tumor, they keep basically cutting deeper into the tissue until they can basically find nothing on the surrounding edges. Unfortunately, as you can imagine, this can be very debilitating, especially if you have one of these tumors in your face or in other areas. It may require some plastic surgery depending on the size of the tumor, but it is very effective. Unfortunately, if you have a late stage or metastatic or a, or a treatment resistant or a recurring SEC, there's really nothing that's very effective. And now there's experimental treatments such as immunotherapies that are coming online, and this has a lot of promise, but we're not there yet. And so really a lot of the research is focused on trying to figure out how to really prevent these more aggressive type of cancers or recurrent cancers. And remember I told you that in immunocompromised people, they may come onto the clinic with 20 or 30 tumors. At that point, cutting them out is just not practical. So there, there really is a need to be able to develop better strategy. So how do we study aggressive cancers? And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take, take you a little bit of walk, not too deep into the rabbit hole, but we're gonna talk about a little bit of the genetics of human SECs. Now, I told you about initially about the car analogy, right? You need to mutate the brakes and you need to have the gas. And so when they began sequencing these tumors, they began to notice mutations in certain genes. For example, these genes down here, kind of like the top mutated genes, these are all um, notch one and notch two are important for how those stem cells that we talked about differentiate. So basically that is also a barrier to formation of tumors, because obviously if you, if you get a tumor, if it basically differentiates and gets lost, that tumor cell is not going to contribute and make a tumor that will metastasize later and potentially kill you. And there we, I showed you talk a little bit about this P53. This is another tumor suppressor. So these are really the breaks. And typically when you have mutations or other alterations, you lose the function of these genes. So you lose the breaks. Unlike what you see in certain genes that are acting like a driver, they're the gas pedal. And so these tend to be activating mutations that turn these proteins on to really drive that proliferation of the tumor. And what you're seeing down here in the blue versus the darker blue is that you find more mutations in basically more aggressive, known as poorly differentiated, more aggressive cancers than those that are well differentiated. And why is this important? So if you think about a tree, and any biologist will tell you that if you look at the rings of a tree, 
it'll tell you a lot of information about the life history of that, of that tree. The size of the rings, the diameter of the rings, how many rings, it'll tell you how fast it grew, whether it was, there was a drought, whether it was disease. And so in the same way, by looking at the genetics of tumors, and this has actually been done not just in skin, but done basically in every tumor to try to figure out what is the commonalities between these tumors and what are the important genes that are being targeted by the cancers that could potentially be areas of therapy. But the, the, the most interesting thing that we've learned about these mutations is that if you actually look at normal skin and you look for mutations, so there's no tumor, the mutations are there. So in a small patch of skin, either my skin or your skin, you will find the same mutations that we find in tumors. There's that notch, there's P53 and other genes. And yet these mutations are not necessarily causing cancer. That's because this is not enough to be able to really promote the formation of these tumors. And actually this is not just common for skin. In blood, for example, there's a lot of genetic alterations that are specifically found in leukemias. They're called translocations. And the interesting thing is that if you actually look for some of these translocations in normal blood, they're there, and yet they're not causing cancer. So just because you have these mutations, it doesn't necessarily they need a little bit something else. They need something from their environment to be able to really promote them. So what we know about ultraviolet radiation is that it kind of comes in two flavors. Three, but UV, UVC doesn't really, doesn't really come to the surface as much as UVB and UVA. So UVB tends to be a little bit shorter wavelength that kind of hits that epidermis and may induce that damage we talked about when you go sun tanning. And it'll induce mutations in those genes that I showed you at the beginning that were have been associated with formation of cancer. But unfortunately, UVA is a little bit longer penetrating that can affect the dermis. Remember the dermis is the, the underlying tissue that supplies the blood vessels and the nutrients for the epidermis. And it turns out that it also can damage the cells known as fibroblasts that live there that can then change the signaling environment or the, the signals that these are giving off such that when these cells have mutations, it can really push them to become a tumor. So in many cases, when you get a precancer lesion, these are known as actinic teratosis, it's not just one area, it's basically a whole area of your skin that may be affected. And so it, it, it can be not only just the cells in themselves, but the environment around them. And this is also seen, for example, in, in cases where you have, there's a disease that people blister and they have wounds, they have basically perpetual wounds. These individuals have a higher risk of developing uh, squamous cell carcinoma. In fact, by the age of 30, it, if they make it that long, they're guaranteed to have a skin cancer. And normally, you don't see non melanoma skin cancer in the population until about greater than the age of 50. So, how do we, how do we study skin cancers? Um, one, I think you may be familiar with the fact that people can use cancer lines. In cancer lines, if every, anybody had an, an opportunity to see the Henrietta Lack story, the HeLa cell story, I recommend you to, to try to see it. I think there's a movie and there's also a book. So basically the tumor, people have made cells that they were able to isolate from the person's tumor and be able to then replicate and have it continually grow. The person died because of this, this tumor, but their tumor lines, their tumor cells, basically have been immortalized and they can keep growing and be used to do research. And we're not going to talk really too much about 3D cultures and organoids, but I think organoids and, and having a little bit closer to what happens in in vivo, since cell lines obviously are not very physiological. And then we'll talk a little bit about direct patient xenografts and as well as genetic engineer models, models. So as I told you, we can take a tumor biopsy and then establish cells in a 2D environment. Basically, a, a piece of plastic is what they're grown at. And they're covered with a solution that gives them all the nutrients to grow. And they have some of the characteristics of the tumor because they'll maintain those mutations that we talked about. And if you then use a very simple assay, which determines how many cells you have in that plastic dish. So each of these dark wells here just shows you the how many number of cells. So then you can take a drug, for example, this particular drug, um, and it'll kill this particular cell line. 
but this cell line, which is a different cancer skin cell line, will be more resistant. So by doing this, you can easily do a screen. And a lot of companies, this is kind of like the first pass if they have a new drug to see what kind of cells it will kill, or if they have a new therapy, it's very easy to do these type of assays. And then they can go up to more, in, more physiological assays. And direct patient xenografts is another way that you can actually do this that's more physiological because you're taking a patient's tumor. They, they don't grow in, in tissue culture, which has certain artifacts that are introduced when you grow them outside the body. And you can grow them in immunocompromised mice such that you can expand them and then you can treat them with a new biological or a new drug or a new treatment. The only downside of this is obviously this is immunocompromised mouse and some people are trying to make these mice have a humanized immune system such that it closely more mimics what happens in humans. The problem with cell lines and also with these direct xeno patient xenografts is that sometimes the tumors don't exactly mirror identically to what happens inside of a human body. So then what is the, the other side to do it? The other way that you can do it is um, by using genetically engineered animal models. And I'm just gonna give you one example. And we're gonna talk about an, an, a molecule called Aurora kinase A. Um, and Aurora kinase A basically is a mitotic regulator. So remember I told you that cells divide, they go from one cell to two cells. And if we just kind of focus on this intermediate stage, Aurora kinase is a protein that lives at the poles of this dividing cell, hence its name, Aurora, like Aurora Borealis or the Northern Lights. And if you look at normal skin, you'll be hard pressed to see not only a cell that's dividing, but also any expression of this protein called Aurora kinase A. When you begin to go from actinic keratosis, which is a precancer lesion, to a benign, uh, basically, skin cancer, to a full, a frank carcinoma, or even a highly aggressive carcinoma, I think that you can appreciate that the pattern of the red changes. It becomes more diffuse, more intense. So generally it is thought that Aurora kinase A becomes overexpressed in a lot of different epithelial cancers, including skin cancer. So to be able to model this, what we did is we made a, an animal model where we overexpressed Aurora kinase. And these guys not only made more aggressive tumors, but they also made there was a lot more metastasis. Metastasis is when the tumor leaves the primary site and then invades a future tissue. And really this is what kills patients because if you can prevent the tumor from spreading from its primary site, most likely that patient can survive or can manage the tumor. So what are the, the future perspectives? Really personalized medicine is one. So where that genetics that I told you about, where we can figure out what exactly is driving those tumors and then tailor uh, a treatment specifically for you and your tumor. And this is important because as we found out with, when people have get, been given certain drugs, there's basically what happens with tumors is that they become resistant to that drugs and they're able to evolve and become something else, or maybe they don't respond to the drug at all. So by knowing really the genetics of that person, their basic genetics, and also what happens to those tumors with those mutations, you can basically better train or tailor a treatment option for them. And I think another area that's really becoming very big is immunotherapies. These have been shown to be very effective for certain tumors, certainly for uh, melanoma, but yet there's portions of people who don't respond and there are certain side effects. So I think this is really very exciting and will become more prominent in the future. And lastly, I think that really to be able to have an effective strategy, I think you need to have combination where you have maybe certain drugs that work at certain stages. And if you know that your, your tumor may develop resistance, then you can kind of do a cocktail that's very specific, combining personalized medicine and immunotherapies. All right, so I'm just gonna leave you with a few links. There's a lot of information on the, on the, on the Google where you can find more information about skin cancer, about normal stem cells, about how skin functions, about how, what, what really drives cancer. And there, there's so many resources out there. So I'm just to get you started, I think if you visit um, the Colorado Melanoma Foundation, they have a lot of information about sun safety and other things. The same thing about the Skin Cancer Org and as well as the uh, website from the government that deals with cancer. So with that, I. I, that is my last slide.